It's a very complex argument at all sorts of levels. First of all, we've reached a world where a subversive is someone who you designate as subversive, even though you're a state subversive in the first place. And if you look at, say, for example, the hatred bill in Ireland, which is totally ludicrous in my view, we're going to have the criminalization of offence as long as you offend them. They can offend you by locking you up, but if you offend the establishment, they'll prosecute you. Welcome to the Cassandra Voices podcast, an Irish home for independent journalism with a global perspective. The prophetess Cassandra advised her fellow Trojans to reject the horse the Greeks had seemingly left behind as a gift, but was ignored. Our Cassandra Voices podcast offers cautionary tales and inspiring narratives to illuminate our own troubled times. We'll be putting out regular episodes reflecting the broad scope of our magazine's coverage over the last six years. Thanks to the Loafing Heroes and especially Bartholomew Ryan for the use of their track Rogoira from the 2019 album Meander Tales. I'm Luke Sheehan, interviewing David Langwalner. David is an Irish barrister practicing in the United Kingdom, a regular contributor to the Cassandra Voices magazine. He is represented in criminal cases, including murder, at the highest levels of the UK system. He has extensive experience of constitutional and immigration work. He lectured in constitutional law for 16 years, the King's Inns in Dublin. He has also litigated many such cases in Ireland and the UK. I Heavy with life, exhaled and bled We are weight bearers We carry your shit to the end of our day we are Following Julian Assange's final hearing regarding his threatened extradition to the US and before the judgment was issued to decide Assange's fate, we spoke about the resonances and the legalities of the case, the implications for justice and freedom of speech and the erosion of journalistic and other valuable voices around the world. We give credit to Anna Colways, Musician of the Month for March. My friends were held up at gunpoint, I was held up by their arms. We are who they call disposable in no uncertain terms. I am who's taken the long way, who was followed by men. I am the keys and the fist, for they will follow again. David, thank you for speaking to Cassandra Voices. Julian Assange did not appear at his final hearing due to an illness. Those closest to him have spoken of the physical frailty he's in, and that physical state has played a role in the campaign to free him and the argument in court. What is His Majesty's prison of Belmarsh like, and what do you make of his fate over the last decade? Well, there are two separate questions. His Majesty's prison, Belmarsh, which I have been inside, visiting is a category A high security prison reserved for the most serious prisoners. So it's a it's a very severe place, but it's still not comparable to American correctional facilities or institutions. So I would imagine the British authorities are treating this Mr. Assange with a degree of care. But of course the second question is irrespective of of course the fact that he's surrounded by people who are murderers and uh, convicted of murder and he's surrounded by very dangerous offenders. And it is the reason I, I've been inside the prison, but equally I frequently go to Woolwich Crown Court. It's the Woolwich Crown Court complex is not unlike the way Americans place their prisons, in that it's relatively self-contained, and a little bit remote from Plumstead Station, and Woolwich Crown Court's in the middle. On the left is Belmarsh Prison, and on the right is Thameside Prison, which is a Category B prison. And um, there is a connecting tunnel where the prisoners from Belmarsh go under the tunnel. I, colloquially, I wrote about it some years ago and compared to the Bridge of Sighs in Venice. You know, there's a, no one has access to it. So it is a very severe place. It's a, you know, and no doubt his conditions are, particularly of 
because who who he is are monitored and surveyed. But I cannot imagine the British civilized penological system treating someone like Kim Chabelain, unlike what might happen in America. But the other aspect of your question is he's been locked up in the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, he's been uh, harassed for numbers of years. It's almost like he's served a major prison sentence already. He's 53 or 54 years of age. He must have had an effect on his health, a huge yeah. effect on his health. Sure, he's in a frail condition. People say so. The youthful images of him as you go into Woolwich Crown Court, there are all those placards for Julian Assange and so forth. I think are probably historic in terms of the way he looks at the moment. Let's speak about the place, though, where he may go if he is indeed extradited. What will be his likely place of incarceration in the United States? Well, I've been to what the Americans call correctional facilities. And I've seen some pretty awful ones. Um, I understand that they seem to be sending him to one of the CMU, the specialist facilities, which are effectively sensory deprivation facilities. You know, it'll be 24 hour lockdown. People will have to wash and limited levels of exercise, jumpsuits perhaps. The, the whole thing is to subject someone to inhumane and degrading treatment. In fact, th that is what the American prisons are effectively like. And it, it seems to me that if he is extradited, it'll be a living death. In an odd sort of way, I'm not condoning this at all, but in an odd sort of way, uh, Mr. Putin's treatment of Mr. Nesvili um, <laughs> is at least immediate. And then, of course, there's the fact that the Americans have demonized him. So they will not, I think, they will treat him with as much perfunctory. And of course, these places are not, they're very remote, and they're very hidden, mm. and they're very private. So no one will really know what's going on. I mean, if you remember, right. Guantanamo Bay was only exposed by the pictures of the American Marines abusing the prisoners. So mm. one can of think it's a pleasant experience and it has all sorts of human rights implications. I'm happy to talk about that. Let's go to the moment um, that he had in court, two-day hearing, and just refresh a sense of the arguments there. And I'll read a short quote that I took uh, from an article uh, via Agence France Presse. This is a quote. On the first of two days of evidence before two high court judges, the 52-year-old's leading lawyer said previous rulings contained errors of law and that the U.S. charges against him were, quote unquote, political. Mr. Assange was exposing serious state criminality, Edward Fitzgerald said, adding that he is being prosecuted for engaging in ordinary journalistic practice of obtaining and publishing classified information. There is a real risk that he will suffer flagrant denial of justice if sent to the U.S., Fitzgerald argued. So picture yourself in court, if you would, or in a similar case. I mean, if you were making a defence like this barrister, what would you emphasise? It is lost in the whole Brexit mix that although Britain has left the EU, it has not as yet, despite the Conservatives wishing to do so, left the European Convention on Human Rights. British judges, unlike the Irish judges, it must be said, are quite zealous in enforcing the provisions of the British European Court of Human Rights insofar as they can still oh. enforce them. And within that structure, I think the perhaps the most important case, is a very old case, funny enough, against Britain, called Soaring the UK. And the facts of the case was this guy had killed his parents in Kentucky and he, he oh, came yeah. over to Britain and he's arrested at Heathrow Airport. The Americans want him back. And mm. they English the European Court of Europe rights said in effect that his Article Three rights would be violated if he was sent back to America. That is the prohibition under the Convention against torture and also inhumane and degrading treatment. And that's because mm -hmm. he wouldn't be subject to the death row experience in an American correctional facility. Well, that's exactly in effect, although they won't sentence him to death, that is exactly what Mr. Assange is going to be subjected to. And so the European Court of Human Rights therefore intervened for the purpose of preventing the British authorities extraditing. But of course, that was an emergency application at the time. In a sense, were you to exhaust all local remedies and go to ECH, or unless they expedited it incredibly, and maybe that's within the contemplation of the lawyers, that, uh, and in any event, the decision as to the application of Article 3, or indeed Article 2, the right to life, should be a foremost consideration. 
And I suppose that's what Mr. Fitzgerald may have meant by justice. And whether, I mean, I think the question becomes concepts of criminality. The breaching of state secrets and confidential information, if you think uh, there's the Clive Ponton affair in Britain in the 1980s, and there are Irish examples as well, it, it is a breach of the Official Secrets Act or various forms of regulation in terms of the breach of confidential information. States often take it very, very seriously. So, Mr. Assange has committed, within American terms, criminal acts. I mean, that must be. But of course, he's done so for the greater good. And the Americans are very bad, and the American State Department, at casting the lenses on themselves. I mean, for example, the legendary Christopher Hitchens wrote a famous book called The Trial of Henry Kissinger, who just died recently, where he suggested Kissinger, quite correctly, should be put on trial for war crimes because of his actions in Vietnam and Indochina and, of course, his involvement in the murder of Pinochet in Chile. And that led ultimately to a French judge sanctioning Kissinger's arrest <laughs> and Kissinger has to hop a plane back to America where he's protected within the safety of Fox News for the rest of his life as an eminent statesman. The point being that what Mr. Assange was showing was whole-scale criminality on behalf of the American state. And that's, that's, that's the greater good. Uh, historical literary references are often useful. There's the legendary British writer Graham Greene. I mention this because he's so intrinsic to the way the English conscience works in many ways. And it's the intersection between the English conscience and colonialism. Graham Greene famously wrote a book in the 50s called The Quiet American about a guy called Pyle. And it's, it's regarded almost as a prophetic book. Because what he's showing is how American imperialist, that is CIA agency, often creates a destabilized country. And uh, ultimately, that leads to the Vietnam War. And is not that ultimately what Mr. Assange was trying to do in a modern day context, show how American subversion creates a destabilized universe and engages in whole scale criminality. So the legal arguments are blurred and the moral arguments are even blurrier. Incidentally, I did go and check. Some have accused Assange of only targeting America and its allies. But WikiLeaks actually published um, leaks from, say, the Syrian regime, much to their frustration, I, I would think. But overall, his, his biggest leaks were from the US. And um, there's no doubt that they had it in for him since those days. They don't believe in half measures. The point is the precedent in sex as well. I mean, the journalistic quasi-legal argument is... Once you start suppressing whistleblowers in this way, you're undermining the whole concept of whistleblowing. And thus, you're undermining the whole concept of freedom of speech, intrinsic to a journalistic mentality and protected under Article 10 of the European Convention. Uh, now freedom of speech has limits, and of course, that is true. It is a sacrosanct principle of American constitutional the protection of freedom of speech, but they, they don't seem to be applying it in a statist way to Julian Assange. But, but it's like the slippery slope. Eisenhower in his resignation speech, and this is way back in 1960, before Walter Conkrieff, Cronkite said this is the creation of the military industrial complex. He were he, he warned about it in 1960. It is now a corporate statist, almost the fascist, fascist imposition. And anybody who undermines the interests of the state or corporations is now being persecuted and demonized. So Assange is the fuzzy end of the lollipop of the acid case. One thinks also of um say the implications of Edward Snowden's leaks and revelations that America basically gave itself the right to surveil everyone on earth and the only legal opt-out and the only safeguard was for American citizens themselves who in theory had the protection of having to have a judge or a senator issue a kind of warrant to specifically penetrate their emails but there was no protection for anyone else on the planet and the CIA were able to penetrate almost uh, apart from North Korea or China everyone else's internet traffic legally, according to what they just performed. But that's what, that's performed. what the Irish government are doing to Irish citizens now with their 24-hour surveillance and data protection. And mm -hmm. that was the Irish minister going in before a high court judge in camera, so no one knows what happens, on a perceived threat to the security of the state, unspecified, it's only a couple of months ago. And now they have access to the data and can electronically survey 
the entire bloody population. So uh, there are a lot of people involved in this kind of state corporatism. And these are very worrying times for human rights. So perhaps America has set a precedent historically, but other states are involved now. And other states, are, such as Ireland, are, are more authoritarian, frankly, than America, stand, which is not to condone the pursuit of Mr. Assange. So we look at the charge of espionage itself, this idea that um, the US in this case has the right to extradite a non-citizen not convicted of any crime anywhere for a supposed charge of espionage. I found one precedent, the American point of view, who was a Chinese agent who had lived in the US and was lured from China to Belgium in 2018 and arrested and transferred, put on trial. He pleaded not guilty. He was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years. But seemingly, you know, he was doing corporate espionage. This case just seems so different. How possibly can the US uh, make a claim here to be seizing a criminal or a spy? Assange was a hacker earlier on in his life, but how can his work with WikiLeaks meet the definition of espionage? Well, he's an odd thing, isn't he? He's a non-American citizen involved in the subversion of the American state. Yeah. There are other precedents, actually. The most controversial, which led to Robert Coover's great book, The Public Burning, is about the Rosenbergs, of course, executed for espionage, in effect, for treason. And what is most interesting about that is America's failure to comply with due process, or particularly mm. the awful person that is Roy Cohn, or was Roy Cohn. Uh, yes. Was, of course, you know, the, the legendary, most corrupt McCarthy tribunal lawyer, and indeed Donald Trump's, Trump's lawyer. lawyer personal friend. Yeah. And uh, Cohen, of course, pretty much concealed evidence that would have led potentially to the non-execution of Ethel Rosenberg. He went after vengefully and in an unprincipled way. And the Rosenbergs are useful because, of course, they exist in a Conradian kind of shadowland within America, the immigrant community and those that are not fully part of the American apparatus. And so they, they obviously have uh, and then, of course, to them, Assange is a hippie communist. Americans have always believed in freedom of speech, but not for socialists. Uh, if you look at uh, Whitney v. California, even the judgment of Oliver Wendell Holmes, I think, their hallowed principle of freedom of speech does not apply to communists. The, the McCarthy out witch hunt, the uh, witch hunt of Arthur Miller, the constant, uh, Oppenheimer, the film recently is, is effectively at one level about that, about despite all the service Amer uh, Oppenheimer does for the military establishment, they still go after him because of perceived communist and socialist affiliations. I think having studied there and worked there, even though I studied within the structure of what, what remained, or what was uh, the liberal establishment, which is now pretty much God, I think. You've got to understand that, and in a world that's moved far and far to the right, where extreme right-wing views are mainstream, are, are acceptable, you can wonder what they think of Assange. Who never lived there. You've never lived there. It's a very dangerous thing to engage in an act, as he did, WikiLeaks, however, without understanding the enemy, if that is what they are. Because Assange is Swedish, isn't he? He's Australian. He's Australian, sorry. He had a charge. Um, his whole legal debacle began with an investigation after an accusation of rape there under Swedish law. But then he participated in questioning, left the country, was called back for further interview, not an arrest warrant. He was called for interview to go back to Sweden. At that point, he suspected that he was going to be um, intercepted in the airport by the CAA or something similar. That's when he began to hide in the Ecuadorian embassy. So that started this uh, entire well, I'm procedure. Well, I understand his logic in that respect. The, the Sweden has a reputation for being socially liberal, but if anyone's read the books of, for example, The Girl and the Dragon Tattoo, uh, Stig Larsson's book, the, the Swedish state, the shadow state, is deeply dangerous. And they're mm. probably instrumental in the murder of the Swedish prime minister socialists. In the 80s, yeah. yeah, wow. yeah. So mm. um, one can understand that the <laughs> Assange's reluctance in that context. And um, it's become a very treacherous world. And But the point of him not understanding or not having lived in America is I, I don't think he understands what they're like, what the American state is like if threatened. 
it's worth noting the response of the US and other so-called Western democracies, you know, giving a lot of overreach when it comes to hackers and subversives in the digital realm, hackers who perhaps even before they've committed criminal acts, they represent a subversive threat that has um, induced prosecutors and judges and others to apply really, really harsh penalties. Going back to the um, 80s, where Assange as a teenager was involved in a really famous hack that um, delayed the launch of a NASA probe and spread a kind of um, subversive message across the screens of of monitors. Yeah, they remember it and then they, they, they go after people with a, with, to encourage the others to um, prevent well, other people from entering that realm. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a very complex argument at all sorts of levels. First of all, we've reached a world where a subversive is someone who you designate as subversive, even though you're a state subversive in the first place. And if you look at, say, for example, the hatred bill in Ireland, which is totally ludicrous in my view, we're going to have the criminalization of offence. As long as you offend them, they can offend you by locking you up. But if you offend the establishment, they'll prosecute you. And people are in a state of complete failure to understand in democratic terms. That means if you call, say, Mr. Varadkar an idiot, or I've called him worse, then he'll end up prosecuting you. And the, the also the notion of rigorous actions against hackers, even though they haven't done anything criminal, is again the slippery slope to pre-crime, guilt by accusation. I mean, in the Catalan situation, the ludicrous Spanish minister, Luzan, before they were set on, put on trial for holding the Catalan referendum, uh, and also accused of treason, she referred to the uh, the accused as the convicted <laughs> before mm. they were tried. Uh, so th they've got a kind of wrapped up, warped universe of which Assange is, uh, who were moving away towards the hallowed principles of the rule of law, fairness of procedure, adversarial processes. Let he who cast in biblical terms the first stone be entirely innocent. It is a world run by oligarchs, corporate and state. And they're mm. moving to increasing authoritarianism. If they hack you or engage in 24 hour surveillance of you, that's justified because you're a subversive and it's an emergency. If you hack them, no, no, bad boy, mm -hmm. it's flipped. What you are listening to has taken time and resources to prepare. It is a collaboration of committed journalists. Please, if you can, share, subscribe, or support this podcast in whatever way you can. It's a bit like the state of exception is being used in the digital realm, almost in a way where legislation famously struggles to keep up with technology. And then in a state of panic, turns to the digital realm and says, it's an emergency, therefore we must suspend rights and start, uh, you know, in the words of our Taoiseach, modernizing our laws. But what that really means is give themselves special powers to surveil, to intervene uh, I, and I, to convict people. You look at the great jurist Carl Schmitt during the Nazi era, now he was a Nazi, so let's put that in the mix. He warned about the creation of a state of perpetual emergency, and he identified in that context secret laws, which was what the Nazis were up to. And you see this creeping in in Britain and in Ireland, executive actions, executive decrees, or in the case of the Minister for Justice, I've forgotten her name now in Ireland, what's her name? Mackenzie. Helen Mackenzie. Uh, yeah. yeah, going in, as I mentioned earlier, before Alex Jones in the High Court, and going in camera, emergency, 24-hour data retention is bullshit. But, but people are, are buying it. And once you start going down the secret law route or executive mm. action, you're undermining the Bingham principles, the fundamental tenets of the rule of law. Mm. And you do that by creating a state of perpetual emergency. That's always been the corporate fascist rules, you know? <laughs> That's why mm -hmm. we suspect all rights in the Constitution. Fine Gael have always been very good at it. Mm -hmm. particularly, of course, in Ireland with the election coming. So the creation of it, which is not to say that the internet and social media has unleashed a Promethean kind of storm that they need to regulate. There's no question about that at all. So it's precisely the fuzzy end of it. You know, the, the, the awful exploitation of people through the internet, and the, mm -hmm. the free for people to say whatever they want. But equally, 
it's created this argument of a state of permanent exceptionalism, which allows state authorities to justify any measures without formal processes. You mentioned the oligarchs, and I suppose it's worth um, mentioning Alexei Navalny again. It was extraordinary to see Joe Biden immediately meet Navalny's widow and so give you know support to his his struggle, which started essentially with, with journalism, with exposing uh, state secrets and corruption and so on. And now, essentially, if it comes down to it on the US side, it will probably be a presidential pardon or intervention that will save Assange. Do you predict that it won't happen? Barack Obama did pardon Chelsea Bradley Manning, who was the original leaker to Assange. So that seems extraordinary to many observers. Obama should pardon Manning, who in fact was far more indictable under American law as a citizen, as the person who took the information out, brought it out of a secure uh, environment, gave it over. And yet that person is free and Assange has been persecuted. Well, for all his faults and constraints he operated under, that Mr. Obama was a unique set of historical circumstances of the last of the great liberal presidents. When I say it won't happen, I, I, I can't see anyone like that ever getting elected again for the foreseeable future in America. And oh, there may also be some, some political shenanigans. You, know, you never know what might happen behind the scenes. Certainly, if Assange is extradited and he's in the high security facility, the CMU or CM, whatever, um, It'll go all along, you know. Uh, journalists will try and see what's happening to him. If he dies on the Americans' watch, they will have a Navalny situation on their hands. So it might be showtime in theatrics, and they might say, well, we'll leave him out after a while. Um, uh, privately, they won't necessarily announce this publicly until it's happened. Um, he's become a pawn in a kind of geopolitical game, and that's never advisable. And of course, it, it does show that being a whistleblower who I've represented, written about, um, <laughs> it's not exactly a desirable vista in the present universe, you know? I think thematically, um, it, may, it may be of significance that the Australian Parliament voted to try to have him freed, partly because um, the... Strategic Military and Intelligence Alliance with Australia and the US is actually in quite a sensitive period right now. I always felt that the people who could really save him would be the Australians. I don't know how much weight that vote will have in the entire mix, but I would have thought that it had some significance. Yeah, but, but uh, it has not obviously stopped them pursuing the extradition. I, I think the extradition in itself is a, is a statement about the Americans. Uh, Regardless of what they do with him, once he's extradited, it is important that he is. The problem has become the compromised nature of all of this in terms of its exposure of the American justice system. I mean, the Americans don't subscribe to international human rights treaties. They just don't. Uh, they don't incorporate or follow any international rights treaties. And, and you know, Torture is a bit like acceptable if you do it to them. Now, there is the American Constitution, but I mean, at the moment, that hallowed document has been undermined by all the Trumpian appointments. I mean, if Assange wanted a real insight into the way criminal justice is working in America at the moment, shock and there was a case in the American Supreme Court where they refused to overthrow a case on ineffective assistance of counsel, where deliberate evidence was concealed of someone's mental defectiveness and their mental illness, mental disability. They're shutting off a lot of the avenues. And privacy and secrecy and so on, I mean, it's a real shadow governance. And the other thing, I think, is that the world is lacking statesmanship of independence, assuming positions of responsibility and power. That's why it's useful to reference Obama. There has been really nothing since in the Western world. And the forthcoming presidential election in the US probably doesn't give you much cause for hope. Uh, except, of course, you know, uh, Mr. Putin seems to have a unique way to manipulate Mr. Trump. And uh, Mr. Trump is, I think, most likely to be elected. Quite how that plays out in terms of the multiplicity of criminal charges and allegations he's facing. But it, it does seem the zeitgeist worldwide, which is disgraceful, is towards far right wing fascism.
corporate fascism and playing on people's worst populist instincts, left, right and centre, and not least in Ireland with all of these insurrectionary torturings of immigrant communities, which is more of the disgrace of a decadence. I mean, we're living in very turbulent times. It almost seems like in a different way, referencing the jurist Carl Schmidt earlier, we are a throwback now to the uh, era of fascism in the 1930s. And much of that, I think, is linked also to a huge sense of economic instability and environmental instability and playing on people's fears. It's always been the case, warmongering, bellicosity, stage management. But the age of disinformation, truth and manipulation of information, it's become virtually impossible to distinguish fact from fiction and propaganda anymore. These are very dark times. And very dark Um, times to be a human rights lawyer, a dissident, a journalist. I mean, it used to be the case, if you think about journalists, for example, brought up earlier, that, you know, the great tradition of radical journalism, the Polish Kapuscinski, who wrote Shav, Shaz, or Christopher Hitchens, yes. Laws and All, or Pilger, who died very recently. Those yes. people are dying out. Uh, they don't have a foothold anymore. There's no way to get into the system to get monetized, to be able to function effectively. That tradition is going. And the other thing is the consequences. There was in Hungary and in Malta, not in the last year, journalists exposing corruption, murder. That was an extraordinary event. I'm familiar with it. Uh, Her son uh, found his mother's head uh, rolling around in the field outside their house. And this is Malta. This is a tiny country. She was just a a person with, with a website. You know, um, she used to sort of self-publish her own investigations and things. And she got close to the government and uh, essentially the mafia there. And she was targeted for assassination among the people who have been called in for questioning by, I think, the tribunal trying to investigate the murder was the former prime minister. He or uh, and or people close to him. So it's a yeah, it was a very kind of girl with a dragon tattoo type situation. It's like one woman. Think about all of this today is the great Italian writer, the great anti-mafia writer of the 70s and 80s, The Morrow Affair, uh, The Day of the Owl, Equal Danger, because Uh he understood how the anti-mafia agenda works and how they get rid of you. And since we're dealing with kind of a corporate gangster mafiosa culture and the lines between big business and the government have blurred and the state authorities have blurred so incredibly. I mean, if you look at, say, exposing corruption in Ireland, the way they've treated guard of whistleblowers. And if you look at, say, for example, people's hysterical comments about the drugs problem in Dublin, well, well who controls the money supply? It created a neoliberal corporate bandit culture. And Schiazzi gets this right because he understood it within the parameters of Italy, the intersection between the church, the Christian Democrats, the mafia and big business. And mm-hmm. look the other Italian journalist, Savioli, who's alive. Yes. And he, he, who's being he, who's being persecuted by, by Maloney, by yeah, the Prime Minister now. Prosecuted him for yes. causing her offense because yes, yes. he's an immigrant policy. She was a bastard. So yes. we're accusing someone of criminality for calling someone a bastard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Just, and, you know, that's what they're up to. And yes. whilst concealing all the deep structure problems about economic mm. collapse, housing, homelessness, and the things people should be focusing on. But it, it's all very unsettling. And all roads, in a way, lead to Julian Assange being kind of a kind of coalition of interests of a test case for what might be called secular rule of law, enlightenment, human rights-driven values. If you want to slur Assange, you can do so in a number of ways. But to prepare for this conversation, I just refresh my sense of his entire life. His actually very long career, in in a sense, in his world, which did start out with hacking, you know, as a kind of prodigy, a self-taught ingenue genius uh, in the 80s. The people that he would have performed that act with, this is early stage. You're talking about 1980s, even the Internet is barely there. And they managed to get the tools to create these um, spectacular hacking events from the point of view of the state or a big body. That's a certain kind of threat. But think of it this way. A lot of those people would have either melted away, some of them prosecuted, some of them joined 
the corporate side and become white hat hackers, all this. But he became something very different. By the time he founded WikiLeaks, I think he was a very ethically motivated person. There's no way that he took his skills, built them out the way that he did. And by the time he set up WikiLeaks, he did so with extraordinary cryptographic skill. You know, this is a website. If they could have just fired that website out of the internet, they would have done so. But he set it up with other people to be almost indestructible. That was the baseline, the kind of hardware, the, the substructure of WikiLeaks was so strong. He was motivated, I think, very much by an ethical concern. And he thought that states having so many secrets, that in of itself, I don't think he said they shouldn't have any secrets. But I think he said that they accumulating so much secrecy and a culture of secrecy, he thought that that itself was dangerous. And he just took an extraordinary hammer to that notion with his well, colleagues. Gray and Chatterlands and Graham Greene or John le Carre and George Smiley. I mean, people become deeply compromised in all of that. But it seems that the stakes have got much higher in what is a very dangerous world at the moment. And... I think the other thing is whether his, I don't know much about the origins of WikiLeaks that way, but if you say he designed a, a brilliant product for an ethical reason, I'll, I'll take your word for it for the moment. But but, but he, he didn't understand what he was up against. These people, you know, they don't want you to win. What are the implications if he interrupted for whistleblowers and for journalists and the rest of us? But I think the implications are at this stage becoming disastrous. The way absent progressive countries like Norway, the, the Irish introduced a half assed piece of legislation not really protecting whistleblowers. They gang up on you, they demonise you, they falsely accuse you, they ostracise you, they make your life hell uh, within any organisation, private or public. You're not really properly financially or emotionally supported. Assange is uh, an extraordinary whistleblower, but it, it sends a message to anybody who wishes to control people, and that will only create a culture further of unnecessary compliance and compliance to a culture of corruption. It will also create the silence journalists or the self-censoring, which is slightly more worrying, isn't it, really? Because the amount of times I've heard from journalists recently or the last couple of years about we know this is true, but we're not going to publish it because, you know, and it will further create that. In a neoliberal universe where much of the established press is, is bought and sold anyway, where is, you know, where is the Washington Post? Where is Woodward and Bernstein? Uh, uh, even if you accept journalists within the actual epicenter of the establishment. And of course, they were working with uh, Catherine Graham, a progressive individual, as head of the Washington Post. Uh, how are you going to expose corruption within the existing structure? There was the Guardian, wasn't it, who broke WikiLeaks, but that was under Rusbrecher. I mean, rusbrecher has gone. So there is the shutdown and the closure of dissent at all sorts of levels and of people who wish to expose corruption. In fact, it's even more profound than affecting whistleblowers and journalists. It's like the closure of the critical enlightenment intelligence of the person who goes, what if, or arguably, are there two sides to every story? And you can't say that when you should. And so we're also closing down rational discussion and debate. I mean, Hitchens, to reference him, said, if you, if you famously, he said famously, if you disagree with me, well, then uh, stand in line and I'll kick your ass. He meant rhetorically speaking. But of course, he, people like him wouldn't be invited on to kick anyone's ass. And they wouldn't have a debate and they wouldn't have a discussion because they do it with secret laws or firing or managing out or any of the numbers of ways that they introduce either real violence, as in the Malta case, or normative violence. I mean, they'll destroy you to such an extent you'll commit suicide or you're unemployable. I mean, that has become the faith of the radical journalist or the corruption-driven journalist or the whistleblower or anybody within a professional structure who says, you know, the emperor's got no clothes. Uh, sorry, well, you know, this is wrong. And uh, the elites have reached the point of such control and spectrum dominance that they can stop you saying anything about them. And they manage the, that which is said about them. And since a lot of people are enriched by this process, this is scarcely the day of the owl as well, uh, then anyone who stands outside is the boy who cries wolf or the woman who cries wolf. They, they run over you like a juggernaut. And so it, it, the, the Assange case is 
perhaps the, the illustration of that, but it's a phenomenon way beyond Julian Assange at this stage. I mean, one, one really has difficulty seeing how advocates, political, are listing whistleblowers for, for structural change in a collapsing kind of world order would achieve anything. I mean, I, I know that sounds very bleak, but it seems to be true. David, that is a very compelling ending. I think we'll leave the conversation there. You've been uh, so kind to give us your time. I think um, those who are listening who want to consult your wisdom more can find many articles by you on the Cassandra Voices website. And perhaps when you're finished with your current cases and uh, when there's a, a judgment in the Assange case, you might make a statement there in writing. I think people would enjoy reading that. You want that. I, I predict that the last bastion will fall, that they will extradite. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Cassandra Voices is a multimedia project that seeks to highlight independent voices and inspire original thinking with stories from Ireland and around the world. Go to CassandraVoices.com online to read more and look out for more episodes from us in future. Your attention and your support are crucial. Thank you.